Um, so while we get seated, uh, let me just say a few words introducing the panel, and then I'll join the folks here at the table for a more informal discussion. And right, you cannot actually see anything. So maybe I'm going to sit down. I'm not sure it's going to get better. Um, so we are uh, going to have a bit of a discussion about building a strong ecosystem for the next generation of inventor inventions and invention-based businesses. and. Uh, <laughs> First I'll just uh, take a moment, perhaps, to introduce myself. Um, as I said, I'm Carol Dahl. I'm Executive Director at the Lemelson Foundation, and you see that we're um, involved in supporting this conference. And for those of you who don't know the Lemelson Foundation, we're a, a, a private family foundation based in Portland, Oregon. And our founder, Jerry Lemelson, was a very prolific inventor himself. I'm sure he would be excited about seeing the caliber of people here and the commitment to invention. Jerry himself had over 600 patents, so think about that. That's over one a month for the 40 years of his work life. Uh, really an astonishing record. And he knew the power of invention to make a, an improved tomorrow, and also the role invention plays in creating a strong economy and what it has done for this nation for the past multiple hundred years. So Jerry and his wife, Dolly, started the foundation because of their belief in the importance of invention and the need to ensure that there is a future uh, filled with inventors looking to make a better tomorrow. So uh, they started the Lemelson Foundation with that commitment. Um, so we do our work through inspiring and educating the next generation of inventors, as well as working to create an ecosystem that will support inventors in taking their ideas from ideas into application and impact. We think about it in the context of impact inventing. So we want to focus on things that will have a positive social impact. So we don't just focus on things that can be done. We focus on things that need to be done and should be done and are worth doing. We also want to focus on inventions that are environmentally responsible. We recognize that inventions have both the power to create the challenges we face in our partnership with the planet we live on, as well as create the solutions and an improved way of partnering with the planet. So environmental responsibility is important to us. And we also think that inventions have their greatest impact when they reach people. And the most effective we, way we know to reach people is actually through business. So we look for inventions that can become financially self-sustaining because they can be applied and people have an interest in uh, having those inventions in their lives. So impact inventing is important to us. Um, we are going to talk a bit today about the environment in the universities. We know that universities play an incredibly important role in not only being the discovery engine for those things that could be applied to invention, but actually, as we see by the members here in the room and the members of the NAI, incredible engine of invention and the potential for innovation and translation into products and impact uh, for the country and for the world in general. And really, the capacity to take on those big problems we heard this morning about a variety of really big opportunities and problems that invention can uh, bring new solutions for. So in this panel, we're going to talk about what that ecosystem is, and I'm going to introduce our panelists in just a moment because I'm really excited about the group we have together today. But to talk about the potential at the universities to create an ecosystem or environment to ensure that it fosters invention and the translation of inventions out into impact and businesses. So uh, one of the things I want to comment on is that we're seeing entrepreneurship as an increasingly important portion of how ideas get out of the universities and translated into impact. And we heard a bit about that today from some of our speakers. We're going to talk a little bit more about the increasing role of entrepreneurship, but also then to focus on the role that young entrepreneurs play in seeing that translation out of the universities. In fact, I think people are beginning to recognize this in general. You see that with the birth of things like i -Corps. i -Corps is focused on uh, having a student or postdoc take the idea and begin that entrepreneurial endeavor, so the business, the formation of the business. Um, and we're going to talk today uh, with a student inventor about the path that he's gone down and, and how that is. So the focus, once again, on universities, the environment they create for the translation of invention through innovation out into businesses and products that reach people, 
the role that entrepreneurship plays in that versus the more traditional views of commercialization through licensing and transfer um, to existing companies. And then also, very importantly, the role that young inventors play in that and how we can support a more effective nurturing environment for that. So let me stop to introduce our panelists. We've got a great group here at the table. So um, next to me, I have Todd Watkins. And Todd is the Arthur F. Searing Professor of Economics and founding executive director of the Baker Institute for Entrepreneurship, Creativity, and Innovation at Lehigh University. His research and teaching focus on the intersection of innovation, entrepreneurship, public policy, and economic development. He's led Lehigh's efforts developing entrepreneurship curricula and support infrastructure for student startups. He's been principal advisor for dozens of startups and social ventures started by students, and we'll probe a bit about that in a moment. Um, to the right of Todd, we have Walter Valdivia, who is a fellow in the Brookings Institution Center for Technology Innovation. His studies include innovation policy and focus on technology transfer, the politics of federal R&D, and the governance of emerging technologies. His current research examines the distributional outcomes of various modes of university tech transfer, punctuated equilibrium in the R&D budget, and the governance of socially responsible innovation. Sitting next to Walter, uh, we have Drew Harmada, who is, in fact, our student inventor. He is graduated from the University of Virginia in 2010 with a BS in biomedical engineering. Drew continues his education at Vanderbilt, where he's obtaining his PhD in a couple of months um, in chemical and biomedical, biomolecular engineering. And his research focuses on orthopedic tissue engineering and biomaterials. While at Vanderbilt, Drew co-founded Puragen, I hope I pronounced that right, yep. <laughs> a medical device company dedicated to the advancement of wound care through the development of a pipeline of synthetic skin scaffolds. And finally, at the end of the table here, uh, we have Vinit Nijhawan, I'm sorry, I'm messing that up terribly, I apologize, who's a managing director, Office of Technology Development and Executive in Residence at ITech, which is the Institute of Technology, Entrepreneurship, and Commercialization at Boston University. Vineet has over 30 years' experience and has launched five startups. He's been CEO of three of those, and all five were acquired. Vineet has also been a, a venture partner and um, over two years sourced over 200 deals and investments, one of which was for $430 million. So he knows how to get technology out there and into companies. Um, and at Boston University, he is involved in creating the environment for technology transfer and entrepreneurship commercialization and also teaches in the area of entrepreneurship, so deeply involved with students. So I'm going to start with a discussion. We're going to leave a bit of time at the end uh, to engage the audience in the discussion as well and, and share some of your perspectives and questions. But I wanted to start um, at the table by uh, just turning to each of our uh, participants here and ask them a bit about some of the work they're doing and how it relates to the topic. <laughs> so Walter, I'm going to start um, sort of starting at the macro level. You published an interesting study this year, which some of the folks in the audience may have uh, read, uh, which is really challenging university leaders to think about the current paradigm of how inventions translate into market value. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that study and also uh, what was your goal in doing the study, but also top kind of two or three findings that came out of it related to entrepreneurship. Um, of course. Uh, thank you, Carol, for the invitation. And, um, for the opportunity to speak about my research uh, and what we do at, at the Brookings Center of Technology Innovation. Um, I'm very pleased to be here um, uh, among um, true inventors. Um, in, in Washington, D.C., uh, it is a, a, a common joke uh, to say uh, or to speak about how little Congress works. Um, so I had to travel to the, to the exact opposite coast to find people who actually work and invent something. <laughs> create something. Um, res responding to the study that uh, Carol mentioned, um, specifically, uh, it sketches a trajectory of um, technology transfer policy and the response of universities to technology transfer policy. So um, I'll just give you a few milestones uh, in this trajectory uh, from which we could um, form an idea um, of 
of the lessons on how the system of technology transfer in university is configuring. Um, in 1980, uh, Congress passed an act that uh, probably most of you are, fa um, are very familiar with, the Bayh-Dole Act, um, allowing universities to take title to patents derived from federally funded research. This um, had been done before. Bayh did not start patenting of universities, um, but it was not um, by any means a unified rule in the federal government uh, because each agency was allowed to establish their own um, rules for uh, allowing or not patenting of the research contractors. Um, the act, therefore, did not start patenting, but did enable, to create the, the legal framework for universities to uh, be encouraged to develop the organizational capacity for patenting. And, 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 and you can see a, an exponential growth of this uh, organizational capacity into the 90s, where most research universities um, acquire this capacity. What is interesting is that um, creating this organizational capacity became a standard for universities, um, even though it has become very costly for most universities. Only a few universities I found in my study make money out of technology transfer. Um, it is a terrible business for universities <laughs> to do technology transfer. And here's the key aspect of, of, of the direction in which I, 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 I took my research. Finding that this is a terrible business really speaks to the resolve of universities to contribute to their public mission, to contribute to the innovation system, even at the expense of having a cost center. Uh, because this cost center, the, the, the Office of Technology Transfer, is the vehicle. Um, it's perhaps the, the foremost vehicle for universities to um, contribute to innovation. And this contribution, um, it is not only um, driven by uh, university administrators, but it has external pressure. Um, over the last 30 years, uh, there has been a increase in um, understanding that universities ought to contribute to the regional, uh, regional economies, and there's a, a mounting pressure that I have described as an accountability crunch on universities, how to, when universities are held accountable for the public funds they receive uh, from the federal government. This pressure combined with um, operating in the red has, of course, uh, led universities to uh, be very creative as to what new models they could do to um, continue and promote innovation. At the same time, they manage this uh, difficult financial situation. And one of the criticisms for universities were, was that once they had a blockbuster patent in their portfolio, they were very tough negotiators, alienating industry. Responding to the criticism, addressing the accountability crunch, and trying to address the financial woes of the technology transfer offices, we have seen over the last 10 years new models of technology transfer emerging from the university. Um, these motivations have led universities to consider stronger university industry partnerships, to uh, engage uh, local uh, governments, uh, local and state governments, in uh, establishing incubators and research parks. And what I describe in uh, the paper as the nurturing startups model, which is in, in increasing the commitment of universities to nurture um, a space for faculty and perhaps graduate students uh, to move ahead with their inventions and taking them into a commercial um, or realize the commercial prospects of these inventions. And so I'll just finish my remarks. I'm happy to elaborate further in question. The questions, the nurturing startups up model is um, one of the ways in which universities will encourage entrepreneurship without, or responding to the criticism and without having to incur in additional uh, expenses. Great, thank you, Walter. I'm gonna turn to Vineet and ask you a bit about um, the landscape at Boston University as managing director of the Office of Technology Development there and also as a university leader around entrepreneurship. You know, what kind of environment exists at the university and, and what role does entrepreneurship play in both your view but the university's view and, and practices and programs around the translation of inventions and in, out into innovations and companies? And then I'll ask you also to comment on what role the student inventors are playing in that. My mic's off. Here we go. So, um, 
So Boston University has been around a long time, since 1839, but really was a commuter university and didn't become a research university until the early 90s. That's when we started giving PhDs in engineering. Um, and then, but in many other ways, it's been a real leader. We formed our tech transfer office in 1976, actually before MIT, believe it or not. Uh, we were the first university to have a venture fund, the Community Technology Fund. Um, but as often happens with, uh, you know, early entrance into marketplaces, uh, we didn't do very well. And um, that's starting to change. So uh, let me address the student side first. We, we created an entrepreneurship institute, think about a dozen years ago. And it started in the management school. And, you know, we're teaching entrepreneurship. You get a concentration in entrepreneurship. Uh, but it's now expanded to engineering, to the medical school. So there's a lot of interest in entrepreneurship from students across different faculty, even, even the law school or our school of hospitality, which you know you think needs entrepreneurship. Or frankly, even our school of fine arts. You know, I went and talked to the dean the other day and I said, look, if you're an artist, you're fundamentally an entrepreneur. You've got to create a market for your art. It means you're an entrepreneur. And so we started thinking like that, but it takes a long time to put those things in place because the logistics of classes, the logistics of degrees and crossing across schools. On the tech transfer side, um, you know, I was asked to take a look at this tech transfer office five years ago. I, I really knew nothing about it, to tell you the truth. But I looked uh, around the country and said, well, you know, whose model can I steal? And um, I, I really didn't find a model that I felt was I could take wholesale and, and make it work at BU. So I created a new model. And it starts with a simple motto. It's maximize collisions, minimize friction. And um, maximize collisions means how do we make as many connections between what's happening at the university and the market? Because frankly, the tech transfer offices cannot curate this da data. It's a massive data management problem. So you really need the market to help you figure out you know, how to bring these things to market, or if not. And minimize friction is simply how do you become easy to do business with? Because universities are actually quite difficult to do business with. And in, you know, you, Walter just alluded to that. I mean, industry really feels that universities are very difficult to do business with. And when you start, especially when you start moving towards new ventures, it's even more important to reduce friction because the last thing a new venture needs to do is spend its early money hiring lawyers to negotiate agreements with universities. And so the result of this in five years, um, we've generated more venture-backed startups, more royalty license income than 34 years cumulative prior. And in fact, last year we broke, we actually made money for the first time in 38 years. <laughs> we'll see if it's sustainable. But <laughs> <laughs> Great, okay. I'm gonna to turn to Todd now. Um, you've been instrumental in building Lehigh's startup culture and uh, also creating a culture in which students can move their ideas out into companies and businesses. And you've had a number of companies that have started from student prospects um, and ideas. Uh, so tell us a little bit about um, examples of those programs and, and maybe some of the student companies, but how you're fostering that. Sure, appreciate that. And uh, you know, I also appreciate the, the comments already on the panel because I think our experience resonates quite, quite a lot with, with what I'm hearing. Um, so my institute on uh, Lehigh's campus is called the Baker Institute for Entrepreneurship, Creativity, and Innovation. And it was a long process to come up with a really long name. <laughs> Because um, we really think that all three of those pieces are, are central to the process, the creative environment. You have to have a, a place that's fun and people want to be inventive and they want to be creative. And, um, you know, that kind of infrastructure in a supporting environment is really important. The innovation process, bringing ideas to practical reality and then entrepreneurship, sort of scaling those ideas to have impact and sustainable impact on, on the world. Um, and uh, so those are our sort of main things. Our programs and our curriculum and uh, our mission is really built around that. We're a university-wide program from the beginning, and we've been a university-wide program, so we don't have a, I, don't, I report to the provost rather than any particular dean, um, which gives us a remit to look at engineering, to look at business, to look at the humanities, social science, doesn't matter to, to us, I'm agnostic. Um, some of the programs, let me just sort of start with the low-hanging, easy stuff to do that we started with. 
um, in terms of creating a culture and an environment on campus. I should preface this by saying we have about 50 startups a year that come out of the university. Most of them fail, um, and that's part of the deal, uh, you know, celebrating that failure and, and just giving students and faculty the experience of going through it is as much or more about what we're about, and some of them are quite successful. So um, that's uh, the environment that we're in. Lehigh is about 5,000 undergrad, 2,000 grad students. That's to give you a scale of what we're doing. Um, so the first easy thing that we did is create a series of competitions just to celebrate innovation and entrepreneurship and creativity. Uh, and some of them are just what's the coolest idea on campus. Some of them are what's the best you know startup that we've got. We've got five different competitions in different spaces. So. Um, and that's cheap. Uh, it's cheap to do. Alumni love to fund it. They can give you 5,000 bucks to sponsor a prize. Um, and uh, it also is a mechanism for students and faculty to self-identify. They come out of the woodwork when you offer up a little bit of money. It doesn't take a lot. Some, some schools have these $50,000, $100,000 innovation competitions. Ours are like $5,000 and we give a lot of second, third, fourth, and fifth prizes. Um, because we want students to be in our orbit and to sort of you know feel like they're part of us. So $500 for being a, a runner-up or something like that, uh, it, it doesn't really help their company, but it really helps their um, uh, entrepreneurial attitude when they're on campus. And then they want to come into our office and find out what they can do next. Um, and the faculty, believe it or not, kind of like those little medals as well. Um, and uh, so that's... That's been kind of fun. Um, the second thing is we've got about 80 plus programs a year that are extracurricular of all imaginable flavors uh, across campus. So outside the curriculum, we're really trying to build an infrastructure and, a, and an environment where people are just interacting with real deal entrepreneurs, with real deal industry. Um, and so we have bioinnovation workshops where we're, in a, uh, we're working with medical doctors and students and faculty members just, hey, what's your big problem in the hospital that we can solve for five bucks uh, this week? Um, or uh, global problems, you know, we have a day where uh, undergraduates and a sorority sponsors it uh, come together and they just, they brainstorm for three hours about solving global problems. We're not expecting any real solutions to come out of that, but as part of the building the culture and they, you know, they get a, they get a certificate of, of, you know, hey, their team won the global innovation uh, workshop prize. Um, one of my favorites that we're still working on, I think it's a work in progress, is what we call the Bench to Market Workshop Series. We invite graduate students um, from most of the labs on campus to participate and faculty if they're interested. And we have uh, a professor of practice who has some experience building tech companies out of research, or he's a PhD chemist, building um, companies out of laboratories and what is the process that you need to take and it's a series of workshops lunch we give them free pizza um, and we do uh, an i core like activity where we do a business model canvas a activity with what do you need to do to make to push your technology to the next phase to get it commercializable in the marketplace it's a non-credit thing for the graduate students and um, you know we beat the bushes trying to trying to find them we work closely with the tech transfer office to identify who the faculty and grad students that might be interested in that kind of stuff is um, we also do a lot of immersion programs where we're trying to get our students and faculty just in the soup with entrepreneurs venture capitalists and so forth we take a trip to uh, silicon valley we're on the east coast uh, we go to Silicon Valley with 50 students in tow and spend 10 days out there just meeting venture capitalists and startups and you know, live in the, we do the same thing in New York City. We're very close to, we're about 70 miles from New York City. Um, and we go to Boston and do the same thing. Um, another thing that's got kind of a favorite, and then I'll stop here, uh, like I said, we've got a lot of programs, um, is what we call Tech Entrepreneurship Week. We have a master's degree program. It's a one-year master's in technical entrepreneurship. Uh, it's a master's of engineering program. Um, and those students, as part of their curriculum, we spend a week in January where they have to spend the entire week essentially practicing the stuff that they've been learning in the classroom. And what they practice it on is stuff that the tech transfer office has identified. So they spend a week working with a faculty member, usually five or six faculty members on campus, and we put teams of five or six students from the tech entrepreneurship master's program. I think you could do this with MBAs as well. Um, and they essentially live the week trying to identify commercial opportunities for the tech that's coming out, of the, coming out of the labs. And so they have to build business models and they have to look at customer discovery and sort of do some prototyping and testing. It's a very quick turnaround kind of, kind of deal. Um, and uh, oh, one final thing. I serve as the entrepreneurship director um, and a faculty member in economics. I serve on dissertations in engineering um, and in 
the sciences. And one of my colleagues, Rupsan Gupta, is getting inducted tomorrow into the NIA, NIA um, and he and I uh, serve on a dissertation together. So my role is the entrepreneurship role. What can you do as a grad student in your dissertation research to think about the commercialization problem? Um, and it's kind of weird to sit through, you know, dissertation talks when I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> um, but it really is, it, it, it makes the students start thinking while they're doing their research from the beginning about the commercialization problem. That's great. So I'm going to turn to Drew now. And Drew, you know, you've done it. So you had an idea, you were involved in research, you, uh, you know, had something you thought could have real value and impact, and uh, you started a company. You're still, uh, you know, in your graduate years. and. Uh, I guess I'm sure people in the audience would love to hear your story about the company, what the technology is that you're working on, and then also a sense of what your path was, how, how you got to starting the company. Sure. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And I'm excited to hear what Lehigh is doing. Those are some really interesting activities. Um, but from my perspective, Purigen is dedicated to advancing the wound healing um, forum by providing clinicians with synthetic scaffolds designed for specifically deep voids. And these are often um, injectable, settable materials that we're designing. And these materials, uh, this platform technology was actually developed at Vanderbilt University um, in the laboratory that I'm doing my PhD in, um, directed by uh, Scott Gelcher. And this laboratory is dedicated to polymer tissue engineering, both in skin and bone applications. And many of the research projects are um, motivated by translational aspects and clinical motivation. And so this type of research really lends itself easily towards commercialization pathways. And basically the way this concept came about was there was a skin a wound healing project that had been in the works for several years. And, and after obtaining some promising results and uh, discussing these results and the concept with clinicians and hearing about their struggles and, and some uh, voids in the market, I took it upon myself to explore um, what ad additional steps we could take to move this concept from the bench top. And, and our laboratory had uh, licensed several technologies previously to larger companies, but this, this technology in particular um, didn't, have, didn't have a home. So, um, I was excited to, to explore the opportunities that it had and to, and to really dive into the, its potential. And to go to that next step, the, the daunting question for any entrepreneur is, oh, how do we get started? And that's not only just in the academic setting, but also any entrepreneur. And, and, and for us, the, the first key was um, working with a group called the National Collegiate uh, Innovators and Inventors Alliance, now called VentureWell. And I had applied for a small research grant as an undergrad through this program and had heard about it. And then also another team, um, a group of students at Vanderbilt had gone through one of their programs called the E-Team program. And this program really set us in the right direction right from the beginning and helped us understand what the first steps were, what the second, third, fourth, and <clears throat> hundredth steps were but this E-Team program provided um, tranche stages and tranche applications, tranche grants. So it wasn't a daunting task to put all of your eggs in one program or one basket. We could really step through this slowly and evaluate what our value proposition was and evaluate if we had something worth really pursuing and worth really putting our time and effort into. So I attribute um, the, the catalyst for Purigen uh, through VentureWell's program, providing us with travel grants, providing us with larger funds to do first iterations of product development, and going through their six-month um, accelerator program to really evaluate our proposition and, and hone in on our, our business plan. Um, so that was the, the first thing that I think really got us going from from the academic perspective. Right. So maybe I'll dig a little deeper with you, Drew, which is um, to ask the question of, so it sounds like one of the good things your university did was they were members of VentureWell, so that meant that you could apply and get funding and, and be involved with that. But I guess another question would be, you know, are there things that either were helpful that the university itself provided to you or um, things that they could have provided that would have made life easier. And then I have another question that I, I uh, hear from many inventors who are creating physical products, which is um, 
once they start the company, and particularly when they leave the university, they don't have a place to actually continue to do their engineering. And I'm curious if you've stepped over that barrier yet and how you're facing that. So uh, there's also one other point I wanted to make was while we were going through this uh, venture oil program, we incorporated and made ourselves eligible for um, through small business grants, SBIRs, STTRs. So that was also something that we pursued. Um, but related to the challenges we faced, uh, as I mentioned, just getting going. Uh, that was the first challenge. But the second was really being taken seriously um, through many viewpoints. First, uh, at the university, every university is different, but really conveying that this is a student-driven idea. This is not um, a being pushed by a professor that were those conflicts of interest, really showing that this is something that um, myself and other students on our team wanted to pursue. And then also um, showing the private industry that we are serious, that we're not, this is not just a student project, that this is not something that we're doing for a grade, this is completely independent of our thesis, this is something that we really feel uh, has a viable commercial potential and uh, gaining their trust and gaining the credibility through good advisors and partic participation in uh, programs like the Venture Well program to um, show that we are serious. Um, and that's a fine line uh, a difference between wearing a university hat versus wearing a small, small entrepreneur or company hat and, and um, walking that line between those two uh, issues. Uh, we had some issues um, with the tech transfer office, it was really just getting on the same page with them, understanding what portion of the technology is viable and, and accessible to us and, and, and uh, granting us those opportunities and comparing as we've talked about um, throughout the day already, the tech transfer office is a business, and so understanding from their perspective what um, value we bring to this technology more in the long term versus the short term uh, with respect to royalties and, and conveying those uh, that potential. Um, throughout the process, we've been lucky to have a great deal of support, first of all, uh, from my professor where the, the technology is based, and that's um, that is the ultimate support. If we didn't have that support, uh, it would be very difficult as a graduate student under his guidance and as um, to continue with this pursuit. Uh, it's taken some time away from my uh, academic research, but it also has improved my understanding of the academic research. So I think it goes hand in hand, but you need the support of the professor. Uh, additionally, the support of the tech transfer office, as well as uh, third-party groups. We've really leveraged um, independent organizations that have helped us along the way, and also uh, relying on a network that we've grown as we continue as students, really um, listening to those that have gone through this type of process and, and learning from their mistakes. I think gaining their trust and, and support has been vital in, um, in our endeavors um, continuing. So in terms of uh, the next steps and how we're uh, going about that, uh, it's, it's, we're still, we have a plan in place. Um, we're still pursuing larger sums of, of money and funding, and that's something that all entrepreneurs face on a daily basis. Um, luckily, there's, there's some resources in Nashville, Tennessee that we're hoping to leverage that has um, uh, relatively cheap a laboratory space um, that we can utilize in the short term and then um, for a, a seed funding and then continue through uh, larger spaces for uh, round A as well. Um, great, great. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, turn back to Todd and ask you, you know, how, how has this entrepreneurial environment been created at Lehigh? What were some of the barriers? I would imagine folks out here in the audience are thinking, well, my university could be doing better at that or my university is doing well at that. But what kind of challenges did you face and how have you created a culture there? How would others approach it? Um, that's a great question. So we've been at this for about 20 years. Um, and uh, like Drew, our, one of our very first momentum builders was what is now called Venture Well, mm -hmm. the uh, Lemelson sponsored uh, what the time was called the NCAA, uh, NCIIA. Um, uh, and, hence the um, name change. Yeah, hence the name change, yeah. <laughs> Um, March Madness is on the mind, um, although Lehigh can't beat Duke this year, so I can't. Uh, um, so the uh, uh, you know early momentum was built uh, in several ways. I think it, we just sort of started not knowing what the, where the heck it was going, and that was really important, I think, to just 
generating uh, the energy uh, on campus, and we got a grant from uh, VentureWell uh, to do some curriculum development, and then one of our student companies got an E-Team grant, sounds like what, uh, sort of similar to what Drew did, and then they, they ramped up relatively rapidly, and we celebrated the success. Uh, we were, I, I would say, relentless promoters, self-promoters, um, and that was pretty important to us. We partnered with uh, the PR people at the university communications folks. We partnered with the um, tech transfer office. We partnered with student groups on campus. All right, so we were a startup ourselves, and without resources and without a lot of um, uh, you know, funding, so what we had to do was bootstrap. Um, and finding ways to bootstrap leveraging existing stuff on campus was, was really important. We started building things into curriculum because there is money in curriculum. You know, students are paying tuition and, and administrators like to, like to build student programs. And so we found places in the curriculum where we could insert entrepreneurial or creativity-oriented things, project-oriented courses. Um, where students have to work with industry, just as an example. Those are pretty bread and butter now, but 20 years ago, the, that's kind of where we started. Um, so celebrating those early successors uh, and, and partnering. Partnering also with the local economic development folks uh, in the area. There's a lot of money out there for startups and for this sort of stuff, but uh, students like Drew, faculty members uh, are in a similar boat, don't really know how to navigate that uh, infrastructure. So one of the things we've really spent a lot of time trying to do um, is help it not be an accident. Because the first few that went down and became successes did it despite what we had on campus. They found their way kind of by accident. They talked to people. Um, and we're just trying to make that much easier for faculty and students to navigate. Just where do you start? And because the Baker Institute has now celebrated a lot of successes, people see it and they know, okay, well, at least I can start there. Um, and we can put you in contact. Um, another thing that was really, really useful to us, we didn't do this until about 10 years later, and I wish we would have done it much sooner, is just to sit back and do a census of ourselves, because the university has lots of moving pieces, and there was a lot of organic things that were entrepreneurial and innovative happening around <coughs> campus, but nobody was really paying attention to it. And when you started adding it all up, and I actually had a PowerPoint slide that had a bunch of circles on it, and it was just a template that I found, I started inserting just all the things that sounded sort of entrepreneurial on it. And there were dozens and dozens and dozens. We have a Ben Franklin Technology Partner Program from the state, we have the Small Business Development Center, the Business One course has an entrepreneur a little project in it, capstone projects in engineering, yada, 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 right? So it went on and on. And there were dozens and dozens of things. And when I started showing that to administrators around campus, they got all excited about, hey, we're sort of, you know, we're kind of within shooting distance of having a national class entrepreneurial program, but we don't actually have anything that's called an entrepreneurship center. So let's, let's find a way to find synergies between these things and fill the holes and, uh, and grow. So that census, even though it sounds boring, turned out to be uh, really, really important. And then, uh, you know, I mentioned this uh, before, but um, the, and I, and I think um, Esther mentioned this in, in talking about uh, innovation oriented toward needs, right? So finding ways to have faculty, students interact with the real world and find out what the needs in those marketplaces are. So networking opportunities, industry, industry engagement things, the Silicon Valley program we do, bringing real practitioners to campus and bringing the campus out to the world. I was just in India last week with a bunch of students doing social entrepreneurial things in India, looking in the field about what, what, what's going on. Um, that is a really hugely important piece because the energy that entrepreneurs and other practitioners bring to the academic environment and when you go out into it, um, that uh, really <laughs> stimulates a lot of talking, a lot of thinking. Great. So, Vanita, I'm going to ask you sort of the same question. Uh, your program has gone through sort of a transformation since you've come on board and, and you're breaking even, which is terrific, making profit. Uh, give us a sense of, you know, what it took to do that and what are the challenges ahead and, and maybe for folks here in the room who might want to do similar things at their own university or begin to spearhead some change. Yeah, so, um, as I sort of thought about the problem, um, uh, you know, two things occurred to me. Number one, uh, we were in Boston, which is a rich ecosystem. So in the end, it takes two things to bring these things to market, right? It takes talent and treasure. It's that simple. And so we are in a place where there's plenty of talent and um, actually plenty of treasure. But here's the downside. 
all the love and attention for that talent and treasure goes to those two big giants across the river from us, you know, <laughs> MIT and Harvard. So I started thinking about, you know, first I needed to bring some attention to us, and um, <laughs> what we did is we took, uh, you know, we, like most universities, we were doing poster sessions to show off technologies that were being developed by students and faculty. And I said, we're not doing that anymore. We're, we're in the 21st century. It's, it's all going to be screens. We're going to do one event. And then I had a little naming contest amongst uh, the people in our group. And somebody came up with this great name, Tech, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. So we, so we did this, do this event called Tech, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, which is now about to do a sixth version in July. We always get a great rock and roll band. <laughs> and usually from local, even students, if we can get it. And, uh, and we showcase all the technologies. It's been great. It's really brought the attention to the university, you know, away from those two giants. Uh, secondly, we focus on new ventures. And, and my thinking was really simple. Your best option to take research that's being done at, uh, at the university and commercializing it is to give it to a going concern, to a, to a company that has resources, access to market, the problem is it's really hard to do that because the companies don't want you <laughs> quite often. And it could be for many reasons. The timing's not right. It doesn't fit their product roadmap. But new ventures are under your control. So I said, you know, we, we can do new ventures. And again, in, in the battle for talent, which is the most important thing, frankly, because ideas, dime a dozen, really. I, I hate to say it, but just in Boston alone, if my faculty member is working on a problem, almost certainly there's four other people in that town working on the same problem in different ways. But nobody really understands outside the nuances sometimes. So the, the, the real scarce resource is that entrepreneurial champion, right? I knew because I was one. And so I gathered them into starting with a mentor program and actually venture well. Is a common theme here. <laughs> I, I got a, a program grant from them to take that mentoring program and expand it to students as well. So the mentoring program was very useful because it was my farm team of great entrepreneurial champions who could take our projects and get them out there. Because once you've got a, a good idea and you match it up with a good entrepreneurial champion, the treasure follows, hmm. right? And other talent follows. Um, so I think those, I, I would say that those are sort of the big things I did. I would also argue that um, the new venture ecosystem in this country has exploded, right? You just have to look around at all the accelerators in all these towns. In, in, in Boston alone, we have Mass Challenge that gets 300 people in a year, 300 sort of startup ideas. A lot of them are young student type people. We have vertical accelerators like Learn Launch. It's an education technology accelerator that you know, I helped launch in Boston. That's only focused on ed tech. We have um, other horizontal accelerators like Techstars. The granddaddy of all accelerators is Y Combinator. How many of you have heard about Y Combinator? Right? It used to be bi-coastal. It's Boston and Silicon Valley. In the winter, it was in Silicon Valley. In the summer, it was in Boston because Paul Graham wanted it that way. He, pretty soon, he gave up on Boston. It's only in the valley. They have funded hundreds of startups. And do you know which university has had the most uh, prolific uh, student entrepreneurs in Y Combinator? No. <laughs> it's actually my alma mater from Canada, University of Waterloo, not MIT, not Stanford, right? That's where I started my first company as an undergraduate engineering student. <laughs> it was incredibly difficult. There was no ecosystem whatsoever. Now. My son is doing a startup in San Francisco in the richest ecosystem in the world. Completely different experience. So students can do this. I mean, this is the time. That's great. That's great. Thank you. So Walter, I'm going to turn to you back up to the macro level again. You've been looking at a lot of universities, and you see, you know, we have some great examples here of universities who are really taking this, largely because they have champions within the university who are making it happen. Um, but what, what would be your advice? Some, some universities are making the change, some are not, to recognize more the opportunity for entrepreneurship to be part of that commercialization transition and also the role of students. What would be your advice, some of your questions, some of the things you might ask that they consider as they think about that change? 
here are a few ideas uh, of what universities could do. Um, I very much appreciated the, the uh, remarks of Todd um, when he mentioned that he ran a survey of entrepreneurial efforts within campus and lo and behold, he discovered a lot of things going on. This is something characteristic of um, many of the American universities. The American university has a um, trajectory of evolution that um, has uh, borrowed from the British model and from the German model, but has come to have its own identity in time, uh, particularly in the post-Civil War uh, period, in which the American university, particularly the state and public universities, are very much engaged with their um, regions, uh, economies, and industry. The American University is, uh, to be sure, very distant from the uh, caricature of the ivory tower. It is much more engaged than uh, that caricature permits, and this kind of survey precisely uncovers this. And I, I very much agree with Todd that it is a, a high priority for uh, universities to organize those efforts and create a hub that um, will um, promote and organize those, those energies um, to make them uh, even more effective in advancing innovation and promoting a culture of entrepreneurship within campus. Um, the Office of Technology Transfer at each uni a research university is uh, perhaps called to take on this responsibility. And so following from um, uh, my introduction and the trajectory and the new models on technology transfer, these offices could take on a, on a significant amount of work on, on be becoming a hub of, of entrepreneurship in campus um, and the licensing element uh, for the university could be just one of many things in their portfolio of activities. Um, this of course will um, uh, further uh, justify their position in campus and their costs in campus. Um, because the promotion of a culture of entrepreneurship uh, will be the primary goal of these offices. Um, but at the same time, and, and this I mentioned in my report and, and in other research I have published, um, the universities cannot um, do everything alone and they need support from um, state and federal governments um, to advance um, these efforts and um, organizations uh, like like this one uh, could actually uh, support initiatives that um, are bipartisan and that have a chance to pass in Congress or a chance to become actual policy um, uh, through executive action. And here uh, is an example of, of, of something that could be extremely useful and I, and I have recommended uh, previously in, in, in my writing, which is, um, there is um, judicial precedent for the uh, experimental use exemption of patents. Uh, when universities engage in research, they are generally uh, allowed to uh, use without infringing certain patents. Um, of course, um, in, in 2003, there was a, a, a significant case that challenged this precedent, um, but it is still, uh, um, thought generally uh, applicable uh, within the constraints created in 2003, um, but it could benefit from legal clarification from the Justice Department uh, to be practical. The idea is that a not-for-profit organization um, that pursues education and research uh, could be exempted uh, to practice a patent, particularly if this patent is a research tool. Now. I have suggested in the past to consider expanding this, well, norming the experimental use exception and expanding it onto university startups. That within the laboratories of the universities or con the research conducted within laboratories of universities uh, lend or borrow to these startups is also exempt. That would give, it, give it an incredible assistance to uh, cash starving uh, startups to uh, be able to conduct further research and advance their, uh, their, their, their projects. And of course, the moment a startup uh, enters to compete into the marketplace with a product that is commercial, um, all the protections of the patent system becomes, become active again and the exception is no longer valid. But uh, this kind of exception could really give the, univer the uh, university startups a uh, leg into the um, uh, game of commercialization uh, without um, um, 
of course, undermining the protections of the patent system. And this is something that uh, uh, with sufficient support uh, could uh, possibly be um, uh, ruled uh, through executive order or through a memorandum at the Justice Department. And then this is the kind of uh, initiative that associations uh, interested in advancing uh, entrepreneurship um, could uh, lobby for. Great. I'm going to take the last few minutes, I think we have just a few minutes left, to open up for the audience. I'm going to stand up because I can't see half of the room here. So I'll ask if there are any questions for our panelists, uh, people who are interested in exploring their experience. Got one in the back here, yeah? Thank you. Uh, comment and then a question. So uh, one, I just resonated with many of the things that people said on the panel. Uh, as universities make, um, uh, try to create this entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, I've been, had experience doing it at Carnegie Mellon and now uh, oversee entrepreneurship at Harvard. And having a very high level champion is really critical. Uh, a very high level administrative champion makes a huge difference to knock down the roadblocks. The other thing that um, <coughs> Drew said I thought was really insightful and I think that's something that was often missed within universities is that, um, and a, as a person who's had a couple of startup companies myself, you actually learn very uh, um, critical information about where your basic science uh, should be going when you have uh, a, a startup company. And it's actually more insightful than anything else I've ever done in terms of driving my science. And so as we, as we were great promoters of entrepreneurship, it's something to keep, uh, keep in mind uh, to promote to our universities. And the question, would be uh, maybe to Walter and others. But one of the challenges, I think, for universities, and, and I've been very involved in promoting startups at universities for many years, and one of the challenges that we have is, of course, how do we uh, secure that the inventors uh, can have some sort of um, uh, incentives uh, uh, to have startup companies? Because, of course, dilution, for real companies, dilution becomes a really a, a major issue. And uh, inventors, especially university professor inventors, often don't benefit unless there's an early merger acquisition. So there have been ideas about a golden share, 1% golden share that doesn't get, get diluted, and other ideas like that. Do you have any thoughts, uh, does any of the panelists have any thoughts about how we might uh, protect the inventors' rights so that they would enjoy uh, the rewards of a startup company? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I deal with this all the time. We just, we just, I just had the first exit on my watch of, of a company we launched, just got acquired by a Silicon Valley company, and the inventors got squashed, as did all the common shareholders, because, you know, for the usual reasons. Um, but here's the thing. Number one, if the patent is still being used by the acquirer, then royalties are gonna flow, and that's gonna come back to the inventor. So in this case, that's gonna happen. Number two, the acquirer is smart enough to put the inventor on their scientific advisory board and make them whole, you know, through consulting agreements or uh, stock. In this case, it's a publicly traded company, so they got stock options. So I, it, it, in, a, in a perfect market, um, the person that adds value will always get rewarded. But as we know, the world's not a perfect market. And so how can you protect inventors as a separate class from investors? I don't think you can. I, I think I, I, I agree. Um, and let me add a spin, which is that um, I think that faculty tend to have a very naive view of how valuable their idea is relative to the business problem. Um, and building the organization to scale and implementation, you know, entrepreneurs talk about how execution is everything. Ideas are a million. There's a million ideas, and I, I think, uh, you know, Vinit said that er earlier. Um, so somehow building a culture where that's understood, that the faculty needs to be rewarded, it's not just money that's a reward for faculty. Those little gold medals are pretty cool sometimes. Um, <laughs> And our internal recognition, promotion, and tenure, you know, I think those papers that uh, NAI has been promoting, that sort of thing is the culture of change that we all need to really work. Um, and simplifying the process, simplifying the IP process and the ownership process and the deal-making process, because it's that attitude, what pieces for me, I think <coughs> drives industry and drives startups away. And we, we need to really just completely flip that upside down, in my view. 
if I may just add to those comments with, with which I agree, I'm yet to meet the inventor who is thinking of money uh, uh, as a motivation for his invention. Inventors, I think, are moved by um, solving a problem, the challenge of a puzzle, or actually addressing a need. Um, it is when the process becomes innovation that the money equation comes into place. And as, as, as Carol point correctly, um, it is hard to imagine um, inventions getting into use without the market system. So the profit motive becomes part of the equation at some point down the way. But I think most faculty members and uh, students like, like Drew just mentioned his remarks, it is some practical use motivation that is uh, uh, at the heart of it. Um, perhaps what universities could do best um, is uh, focus on the inherent rewards of invention, uh, on putting this creative energy into practical use, um, such as recognition, uh, uh, or, or making, as um, the present remarks were earlier, suggesting a solid gold medal. Um, as recognition, but um, at the same time, there's there's an element to the part when we go into innovation that is important to mention, which is uh, venture capitals will want to work, in most cases, just as a percentage or a fee, uh, for every stage of development of a startup, and 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 the compensation to inventors there, whereas inventors would like to um, hold on to a portion of ownership uh, of a, of a firm throughout its its its, its maturity. Uh, a balance needs to achieve between those of the expediency of the venture capital system and those of uh, remaining or keeping a, a level of control on the companies uh, by the original inventors. And for a very important reason that is not necessarily the, connected to profit or, or, or monetary pecuniary compensation to, to inventors, which is inventors have motivations and sometimes lament to see the direction that their inventions have taken once they are outside of their hands and control. Um, a, a degree of control on the course of the company and the development of the invention would perhaps allow the inventor to continue injecting those original values that inspire the invention throughout the course of development. And even at times we can conceive that uh, 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 some of profit may, may be foregone but the vision of the inventor will be realized uh, if a certain uh, ownership structure is maintained. Do we have time for one more question? Yes, one more. Okay, great. Um, I guess I'll go here. Thank you. Um, I'll keep my question short. Vinit, you said something very interesting. You said that you made money uh, in your air. And what really strikes me as uh, something important about that is that that could be a formula. Maybe you can share the formula with, especially if it's in the context of the NAI, of how you did that. What, what are the components of it? Because really, in order to get people excited, they have to understand how, what was the basis of your measurement? Uh, what's working, and especially you've been at it for a long time, so that I, I think that's really meaningful. And a young guy like Drew, I mean, you could, you could look at that. You might learn something from that in terms of how you can go to commercialization. Uh, it, you may shave, show, say, shave some, uh, some corners off and get to where you're trying to get soon. Yeah, so, you know, also picking up on, on that sort of Chinese wall between basic science and applied, which really doesn't exist, right? They inform each other. It's really Pascal's quadrant and, and, and not that. And I think that's important too. So I teach a case on, on Bob Langer, who's a NAI fellow, and he's also on my external advisory board. He's the most prolific academic inventor today, right? He's, he's amazing. And his formula is really simple. Anybody can read his case. It's, it's, it's really good. So I mean, that's the first thing I did is I read his case, and I thought, oh, this is great. I just have to figure out you know, where the good science is and you know, he's pointed out where the good science is, and then I can attract the talent and the treasure. But having said all that, I'm actually writing this up. So um, I haven't decided where I'm gonna put it. I, you know, it may actually go into a general journal rather than a, 
you know, the specific one. I'm sort of looking at Exconomy or Wired or places like that. So, can I piggyback uh, on that just to, uh, for a second? Which is, um, if we think of the tech transfer office as it, uh, its own little bubble, it, most of them don't make money, and when they do, it's, it's celebrated. But from a university point of view, uh, you know, I sit in a different place. Um, long term, having really happy entrepreneurs who make a bunch of money. Um, and then give it back 15 years later uh, is a money-making proposition. Um, you know, one of our most successful faculty entrepreneurs launched a company at, at Lehigh called Orishur and has donated money back. He's a faculty guy giving money back to the university because he was so successful. There's, there's rooms on campus named after him. Um, one of our biggest success stories as entrepreneurs, this is before our program existed, is Urban Outfitters, and those guys just gave $20 million back to the university. Um, and uh, even the students who got this uh, Venture Well grant, uh, they're called Ecotech Marine, um, they're coming back to the university giving hundreds of thousands now, and they're just you know t five or eight years out of school, um, but they also sponsor research projects in the laboratories, and they sponsor student projects in capstone experiences, right? So none of that came through the tech transfer office. That all came from entrepreneurial attitudes. Um, it's a money-making proposition if you have happy people. And if you're nickel and diming them at the beginning through your tech transfer process, you're going to piss them off, and you're not going to help them. Well, I want to thank our panel. I love uh, the great thought-provoking comments here at the end. I really think an interesting balance of, you know, the immediate and the long-term opportunity here. Um, I think all of the panel will be around after this and as we go into lunch, so I want to encourage you to grab people individually and chat with them. But uh, thank you for your attention, and particularly thank you to the panel for some great conversation. Thank you.